When it comes to getting my hands on the best tasting game meat, I'll go anywhere. On this trip, I'm hunting Sitka blacktail deer in southeast Alaska. But in this no man's land, you gotta work for your game. That was the biggest black tail I've ever seen. I'm Steven Ranella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. It's about sustenance, and survival. It's about connecting to the land. It's about the purity of the challenge. It's about life. In each and every one of us, there is a primal instinct to hunt and consume. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. Alaska. I've done a lot of hunting here, but there's one area in the high country of Tongass National Forest that is rumored to be an unexplored hunting ground for the elusive Sitka black-tailed deer. The thing is, it's hard as hell to get to, but here you've got a chance to hunt for animals that have never laid eyes on a human before. The only way to get in here is to fly in with a bush pilot, try to land on a lake, and get dropped off for a few days. The terrain is hairy, and the weather can turn quickly. That means you're stranded until a plane can fly back in. So it's a bit risky. But for me, the risks are worth taking in order to get a chance to hunt where very few hunters have gone before and where some of the finest game meat in the world can be had. And ultimately, that's what really matters. I mean, I like monster critters and trophy bucks as much as the next guy, but I like good meat even more and it just doesn't get much better than the venison you'll find around these parts. I just saw a nice buck. Oh, you, oh man, I bet you they're all over up here. I've never been to this lake, and the pilot hasn't landed in this lake either. Rumor has it, there's good blacktail up here. But the big problem is tonight, they're calling for massive wind, like 60 mile an hour gusts tonight. My plan is to get down on this lake and get a good camp set up where I can tough it out for the night and tomorrow, hopefully, get a break in the weather and be able to do something. Feeling bad about the weather, but I'm feeling good about the fact that I've seen two bucks circling around. I packed enough food and gear for three days, plus a little extra in case the pilot can't land back in here during bad weather. I got to find a spot to camp where I'm a little bit sheltered from the wind. I'm nervous about this 65 mile an hour wind for sure. And I'm going to resist the urge to run up the mountain and start hunting. Because if I do that, I just know the weather's going to turn when I'm up there. Then I come down and everything's going to be a total mess. So I'm going to try to get everything safe and waterproof. Then I can strike out, boom, up the mountain and start hunting. If it starts blowing dangerously bad, I'll come squirting back down to camp and hole up for the night. It always messes with you because you're, when you're flying over an area, it just seems like you just grease everywhere you want to go, no problem. Then you get down and you realize how much, like, just topography. From a plane, when you're a thousand feet up, things just seem kind of flat and navigable. So hitting the ground was a bit of a reality check. You realize that brush you thought that was maybe knee high is head high. And little hills that you thought you just kind of pop over and have a look or a significant climb, that it's really hard to hunt. It's not that there aren't deer there. I think there's deer all over here. But I'll have a much better chance of finding a stalkable buck once I gain enough elevation to get above the thick brush. And now entering into like country where there's deer and you can hunt. When I get to some good spots where I can see some laying around there, I'm gonna try some calling. And if we raise something up, we'll at least know it's there. Down in that stuff, man, it's like, you know, you could step on one, you wouldn't even know he was in there. I like hunting on foot. Feasibly, in this area, you can walk on ground that, that people maybe haven't walked on, maybe in 100 years, maybe never. If I come into an area, I got a few days to hunt. 
my initial thoughts are about exploring the area. For me to climb a peak, so much more motivated to climb the peak if I got a tag in my pocket and I'm hunting. It's like Everest, unless there's some kind of cool animal up there you can hunt, I just would never be motivated to go up there. If there was some kind of crazy sheep that lived on Everest though, I'd be the first guy up there. My guess, and like I hope I'm wrong, my guess is a lot of deer are gonna be hunkered down in this wind. Probably on the lee side of these hills. staring at us right now. I got a forky black tail. Bow. It's under 200 yards though. It's just going through my mind as it like, coming in here I had like, I don't know man, I was kind of thinking I'd wind up with a big huge buck. But I'm also thinking about winding up with a bunch of buck meat. So I got that here now. I think the smartest thing to do, the best thing to do, is to take this buck here. He just went behind some brush. So. Oh, there. Now he drifted off around the other side. I know I'm gonna like, probably, I'm gonna totally wind up regretting it, not taking that shot. But it's like, like I said, I just landed, just got here. I just need to walk a little more, and I'll be ready to get a deer. I have that just innate hunter's curiosity about what's over the next hill. And everything about this buck says, shoot me and eat. But you start playing tricks in your mind, and you're like, well, I'll wait. Maybe I'll get a big one. Even though I know that in a couple days, I might be totally hungry for a buck that size, but I'm not ready to fill my tag, just because I want to check some more area out. Beyond just the difficulty of the topography and difficulty of the brush is the difficulty of the weather. No one likes to hunt in rain. But here, you're up in the clouds. So you wind up having a lot of periods where animals just vanish. So I'm gonna just try to hunker down out of the wind somewhere. Wait for this to blow through. To get an idea of how bad the fog can be, 
minute I start getting up to the crest and I'm starting to poke my head up, I realize that there's this gorgeous bowl, this kind of boggy bowl below me that looks just like perfect deer country. And right away, boom, big buck. It's a nice buck down there staring at us. I can just see his body's obscured, but I can see his neck and his head poking up. I move myself so that I can move a little higher without spooking him. I'm not kidding you, within seconds a fog bank rolls in and the buck vanishes into the fog. I cannot find that buck, that was a nice big buck. And I sit there and wait, just praying that the fog is gonna lift. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Then it starts to rain. It's just, I can't believe this. A nice buck down there. You just can't see a thing. I don't know how much longer I can sit here waiting for this to clear up. I sit there a full hour in a steady downpour and eventually realize. This buck's just gonna get a pass because I gotta head back to camp before dark. And I also have to factor in that the fog's so thick, I'm not even gonna be able to see camp. I gotta stumble right into it. I just lost a whole day's climb, finally got onto a buck, and in that very moment, got hit by fog and, and had my stock blown. I mean, that kind of will show you a little bit about what this area is all about. But it still really is a paradise. It's just something you gotta work for and hunt for hard. It's my second day out hunting in Tongass National Forest in Southeast Alaska, and I finally get a break in the weather. I'm not an hour into the day's hunt, and I spot a nice buck, but he's way out there. He's more than 1,600 yards, I'll tell you that. Take a look, find him. It's a long way to go, and I'll have to locate him again once I get over there. But right now, that direction is looking better than any alternative. When I finally get to the area where I saw him, I spook him. Big buck, big buck. He's up on that ridge line, 350 yards out. I don't know. I wanted that big buck and I rushed my shot. Just high. I blew it. That was the biggest black tail I've ever seen. Damn. Hunting involves missing, man. I mean, anybody who acts like it doesn't is full of it. And if I'm watching the show where there's been a lot of stuff edited out, a lot of stuff got left by the wayside so that some guy could look like a total badass. I know I screwed up. And miss that buck clean. Yeah, it was a good old fashioned miss, for sure.
But this day is kind of over. I head back to camp for now. Get up and get cracking in the morning. But before I reach camp, the rain and fog let up and I take a minute to glass the edge of a lake for the final hour of the day. And I'm glad I do. Gotta walk up here, feeding along. A little grassy slide coming down out of the temple. I believe I saw that buck. I got a bunch of landmarks picked out, but I think I got a big enough fix on where he is and where I am. I'll be able to go over there and find that buck. Nice. Coastal rainforest. Sick of black tail, man. Sweet. This is awesome. I'm running low on daylight, definitely. It's raining pretty good. What I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna gut this thing, take a waypoint on it, come back and butcher it tomorrow. Um, there's no way to get it back to camp in one piece, so I gotta break it down and carry it myself. I'd just rather do it right, do it slow later, than trying to rush it now with darkness. So once I gut him, I need to get him all flushed out. He's gonna air out for the night, and I'll be back up here for sing in the morning. So that's nice and clean now. I'm not gonna lie to you, like I always have visions of, you know, big monster buck racks. But at the end of the day, bar none, this is gonna be the finest venison you can get your hands on right here. A young buck, a lot of fat, pre-rut. I mean, I love big racks. I like me even more. So this is definitely the nicest morning we've had. Probably the nicest morning we're gonna get. Go up and pick up that deer we left laying. Got everything I need to pack it out. Let's go. Hope he's all right. So I do want to come in here cautiously, make sure I'm not stumbling across a bear. This island here is black bear island which means you don't need to worry as much. I mean, black bears are kind of, you know, not particularly scary. Oh, totally undisturbed. I can take this whole animal out of my back. Once I get rid of a few of the parts, the hide, the extremities, I'll be able to take all the quarters out right on my backpack. Here you can see the entrance hole from that seven millimeter rim mag I'm shooting. There's the entrance hole. Considering the angle of that deer, the deer was angling toward me a little bit, I would have been smart to move that shot a little bit more forward because it exited back behind, nicked the stomach on the way through. So in my mind, a perfect hit is a clean punch in the ribs, out the ribs, just for lung. I don't shoot for heart because I don't like the bolt to go through and trash all kinds of meat on the opposite shoulder. I would much rather lose a little bit of rib meat on each side than lose 10 pounds of shoulder meat. So for me, shot placement, I'm a rib guy, I'm a lung guy. I don't shoot for heart generally. <laughs> 40 pounds of prime organic free range, humanely harvested. Dead meat. 
To understand why I like hunting Tongass National Forest in Southeast Alaska so much, you really have to consider where I grew up. And I grew up in Western Michigan. And there, hunting was like 90% about dealing with competition and land ownership, and it was 10% about hunting. When I started discovering the West and hunting on big tracks of National Forest, where the difficulty of access winds up giving you chances for like exclusive opportunities on animals. It was a, a watershed moment in my life. It's a place where if you've got the fortitude, you're gonna get into some sweet hunting. I'm getting ready to cook the venison loin up. So I got my stove going, got some oil, got my little mini fry pan. We'll cook a couple more minutes. It's already cooked. I mean, I, I like raw meat, or super rare meat. Oh man, I can tell you right now, this is gonna be good. You come into an area to hunt, all your senses take it in. Once you go through all that, it just seems to me like a, it's short-sightedness or just like a major shortcoming to not also like take it in with taste and take it into your body. You gotta get in there and sink your teeth into what you're after. You want this wildness to become part of you. Without it, the experience is incomplete.